Okay, so who thought I was bringing samples? <laughs> yeah, I fooled you. Um, my name's Ted Pappas. I'm the owner of Big Bottom Distilling, which is a LLC registered in the great state of Oregon. I'm also president of the Oregon Distillers Guild. So I wear a couple of hats. Um, and believe it or not, I still have my day job. Yep, so I'm one of those companies. Uh, I like to kind of know my audience. Uh, how many of you want to produce a product more manufacturing type in your inventors? Okay, and so then I'll assume the rest are some type of service. Okay, that's good enough. It's in eh, roughly half. So, um, as you know, I started this company in, in 2010, and in that period of time was a great economic, thriving period of, uh, of this country. But I figured, what the hell? You know, people need to drink, and, and I do. So it worked out really well. So I started the company. Um, it was an interesting thing because, you know, you see all these banks with banners that say, you know, the most SBA loans ever. And the first thing they ask you when you walk in there is, how long have you been in business? And I'm like, well, maybe in about a month. And then they say, well, okay, then where's your house? What do you mean, where's my house? Well, if you want money, then we're going to need to put on your house because you're not on the track record yet. And that was, a, that was something that kind of hit me, you know, being a little naive to this. And I went, oh, that sucks. Um, so how do I figure this whole thing out? So I ended up bootstrapping the whole thing myself. They gave me a credit card, which I'm hoping in a couple years I'll pay it off. Uh, but I was managed to start the company. And we started small. So my first thing is about risk. Only you define the risk you're willing to take. Don't let outsiders try to influence the amount of risk to take. I mean, I love my family, and I really didn't want to put my house up for a booze business. So my risk was at a certain level when I started out, but I was comfortable with it. My family was comfortable with it. They were cool with it. When I got delivery my first four barrels, I was nervous. I was shaking. I was like, oh my God, I've got all this booze. What am I going to do? Well, my last count, I was 100 and something barrels in my warehouse right now, and I'm complaining because I don't have enough whiskey. So that's the first one. Only you define your own risk. Don't forget that. Um, otherwise, you'll get yourself in a situation where you have to explain to your spouse, how come they're living in a trailer now when you were living in a nice house? Um, the next one, which I, you know, when you hear stories about people's success, you know, I love those. Okay, they're great. But a lot of times they tell you about their success, they don't tell you how they became successful. So the thing that replays in my mind is success is a great inspiration. Failure is what you learn from. Because had that same person that gave you this great success story actually told you how they did it, I guarantee you there's going to be points in there about failures that they experienced and how they recovered from it how they turned their company around or how they did something. It's a result of a failure. We don't walk around, you know, walk down the street and go, you know, I think I'm going to start a company today. And then some guy comes up to you and says, hey, I heard you're going to start a company. Here's a check for $3 million. Go for it. And then, you know, you go produce some half-assed product and everyone wants it. You're like, oh my God, this is great. I am selling these half-assed product. This guy gave me money and I got more money coming in the door. People are going, dead or about paying me back. It doesn't work that way. And so when you're trying to learn how you do, how you continue on your business, you learn from failure. So I'll tell you mine, my big one. So I might have a little bit of an ego, maybe, hard to believe. I have a very big truck and that goes along with my ego because I need something to carry it in. But it took, the, it took the most advantage of me came around with the labeling. So my first label I designed. And what was funny is I even made it a point, because my wife claims that it was done by a designer, a friend of ours, but I, I went back and said, oh, no, no, this was the design I came up with a year ago, see? Well, it came back to haunt me. So I'm in the liquor store one day, and I, I'm sure like everybody else, you always take your kids in a liquor store so you can explain the differences of booze there. So I'm in there with my five-year-old this time. <clears throat> so we're over there in the Scotch section, and I'm, you know, this is an early Scotch, and here's Highland, and let's talk about the attributes, and, you know, explaining the malting and the peat and all that stuff. And so then we go to the bourbon section. So we're standing there, and I start to critique labels like I always do. Oh, yeah, this is BS, and oh, I believe these guys. And then I said, you know, I said, God, so where's... Where's my product? I'm looking. And she goes, Dad, it's right there. Where? She goes, it's right there. I'm like, okay, honey, where? She goes and puts her finger on it. Hmm. Wow. It was right in front of me. So that's not good. 
I had been hearing people say to me, yeah, we have a hard time finding your product on the shelf. Well, I never asked what they meant by that. It wasn't that it wasn't in the liquor store. They couldn't find it on the shelf. Someone had to go help them get it, like a five-year-old. Of course, at that moment, which I call the moment of clarity, <laughs> the minute she put her finger on that, Groucho Marx popped in my head and said, this is so easy a five-year-old can solve. Quick, go get me a five-year-old. My ego had driven me to not listen to people and not ask the right question on why this label was bad. So being a smart person, I said, okay, I suck at this. I'm never gonna do this again, which by the way I have, but I'm never gonna do this again, so I'm gonna go hire a designer and I'm gonna put my wife in charge of it and just let her do it. Sure enough, she did it, they did a great job with it. Um, our labels pop on the shelf, you can see them from 50 feet away. And that's what I wanted, and I had nothing to do with it, which was the smart thing to do. Uh, in fact, that whole story actually got picked up by Entrepreneur Magazine, and I was in an article with it about that. And it was just really important for me to, to recover from that. But I mean, I have my product in four states, so now I gotta go to distributors and tell them we're changing the labels. They love the labels now, we're in good shape. But like I said, history did repeat itself uh, with my Calhoun brothers, Brandon, that's a whole other story. I hired a, uh, a really good designer. Again, he put my vision on paper, and it sucks. Um, so we'll be changing that one. <laughs> so uh, the next one is staying true to your mission. Um, so I'm gonna explain a couple of things, and, and there's a lot of things about my business that people, they, they don't understand, and that's cool. You don't know anything about the booze business until you're in it. And anyone who comes up to me and says, oh, I'm thinking about doing this, and they're, they're trying to outline this perfect plan to get in it, I just go, look, minimize your risk, get in the business, because you're not going to understand it until you get in it. So I remember one day, and actually he might be in the audience, um, I won't mention his name because I actually forgot it. Uh, <laughs> I was talking about found spirits, and just immediately he glazed over. He was like, uh, uh, what? And it's spirits that you find, and they're available on the market in bulk. I'm an independent bottler, that's how I started my company. Part of the long-term vision, independent bottling was gonna consist the entire time at a certain point we would bring distillation in-house, enough to provide our own 10-year plan, bring the biggest distillation in-house and start doing bulk spirits and sell them out myself. I'm on track, we get our still in a month, but up until then I've been an independent bottler. But I wasn't true to that. What happened was I looked at the shiny thing out there. The shiny thing was bourbon. And I was like, huh. So I got some really good bourbon in. It's really good stuff, too. So I bought as much as I could. I mean, you know, I was like, eh, kids, you don't really need to eat lunch. So I'm buying all this bourbon, and I get caught up in it. And we start doing these different things with this bourbon. What I happened is I turned myself into a merchant bottler. The difference with that one is, usually with the merchant bottler, they just go and they get a product, they pull it in, they bottle it, and they're done. It's a merchant bottler. I got obsessed with the bourbon, became a merchant bottler, and where I am today, actually about six months ago, I started spazzing big time because bulk bourbon went from about four something a barrel to 1,400 a barrel. Try to absorb that in your cost of your bottles. Like, oh geez. So we luckily had enough stock that we were able to kind of balance a lot of this overpriced bourbon with some of the stuff we'd gotten early on. And so we're still okay, the numbers are good, but I wasn't true to my mission, which was to be an independent bottler. Otherwise, three years ago, I would have started collecting other types of spirits. So in the warehouse today, I've got bourbon, corn whiskey, light whiskey, vodka. Um, God, I don't believe I said that out loud, it just hurts. Um, and a few other things that I'm working on and bringing in. And we've got a, a really great aged rum as well uh, with, with the bad label, which we already talked about. Uh, but I wasn't true to myself, and so be true to your mission. And sometimes you gotta go back and remind yourself, I was focusing on the shiny thing and not paying attention to anything else. And I'm in the situation I'm in today, which isn't really comfortable, um, but we're recovering from that, so uh, I like that. Um, let's see, that one being cheap. Oh yeah, so kind of with the whole bourbon thing about doing uh, that shiny spot, it's like, yeah, I had these flashbacks of my dad giving me these old sayings. You know, 
Bird in the hand's better than two in the bush. I still didn't know what the hell that was until after college. I'm like, oh, I get it now. So I kept looking in the bush for something. Uh, but it was don't put your eggs in one basket. And that goes back to the bourbon thing again. Just, I mean, we were, I mean, we're putting this product out. We were telling distributors, you want my product, you want my bourbon, you better put a PO in now and we'll get it filled in six months. And they were doing it. Of course, now I've got nothing to sell them. So, you know, here we are today. Um, so those are my big lessons for you guys out there. I want to, the fact that you're here today actually shows me that you have the testicular reservoir in order to go into business on your own. And that's big. Uh, there's a lot of people that aren't willing to do it. They're not willing to take the plunge. Whether you're doing a small outfit like mine or you're going to a high tech area, whatever, it takes that to get going. You're going to fail some, learn from it. It's not that bad. As long as you don't put your house up and your kids are destitute and you're living out of a trailer, it's going to be fine. Uh, and also remember, drink big bottom whiskey, taste the room available Saturdays noon to four. <laughs> Thank you.